was his one and only son to save. Welcome to worship at Pledus Church. To all of you here in Worship Center and worshiping with us online, uh, I hope you feel this is your home. God welcomes you as just as you are, so do we. And this is a church. People come with all their questions, curiosity, struggles, and also their celebration. God welcomes you as just you are, so do we. Remember that you are here at your home. And my name is Chung Ho Kwon. I'm one of the pastors here. If this, you are new at first time here at Plattwood's Church, please make sure I will welcome you and make sure to scan the QR code. Let us know you are here today. And we love having all ages together in worship, and we don't mind the joyful noise from our little ones, a little older uh, kids, like our eight-year-old self. So if you need an extra space, find a room. We have a wiggle room just outside of here. So you can uh, spend the time over there. And this is the third week of our sermon three, The Prince of Egypt. Uh, we have been looking at, actually, the way in which we can learn more about our stories through the story of Moses. So let's continue with prayer. Holy God, we seek your presence this morning. Open our hearts to your love and grace and your invitation to a full life in Christ. When we open our lips to greet, sing, and pray, when we open our ears to hear that what Spirit is saying to the church, move our hearts, fill our hearts with courage and strength so we can faithfully follow you in the works of love and justice in the world. God, you are so good all the time. In Christ we pray. Amen. Each week, as we begin worship, we want you to feel a sense of connection to each other as well as the Holy Spirit. As you stand for worship and turn to someone around you and actually place your hand on your heart and bow a little bit and also or give someone Away, but if you can see children beside you, can give fist bump to. Please stand. Let's try this. <laughs> Peace be with you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea, and this is Scott and Brett. Please join us in worship.
Will you pray with me? O oh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise your name. We call you in this morning when we gather together as your people. We lift our prayers for ourselves, our families, our friends, our church, our community, and also people in the world. Give us your peace and healing grace whenever fear or anxiety trying to attack us. In our daily life, cultivate our heart to sow the spirit of gratitude and give us courage not to slow in taking care of our own bodies, which are your creation, and taking care of our neighbors near and far and the world you created. And help our face to see your hands working for those we are praying for. Through the story of Moses, we have been looking at the ways in which we can learn more about our own stories and people in the world. Open our eyes to see the community you want us to build and seek out roles you hope we take to make our lives more meaningful and give us courage to seek the community of peace, love, justice, and mutual dignity and equality in the world. We trust the work of Holy Spirit who gives us a resilient spirit and guide us in faith. And we simply give you thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. Oh Lord, we lift these prayers with the prayer Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Well, this is time we are going to send our grade school children to their awesome small groups. So they know where they're supposed to go, right? Kiddos, head over to this side door. Can you see these lights? We are so glad that you have been worshiping with us today. And we believe this worship is open to all ages. And during this time, ho hope you have time to uh, scan your QR code, make us uh, know you are here with us. I think we can continue our worship. All right, church, let's stand and continue worshiping today. Yahweh 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 Full is your name I don't want to take it in vain Try that movement Yahweh I don't want to 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to worship at Flatwoods Church. Uh, for those of you gathered in the room, it's great to see all of you. For those of you worshiping with us online, thanks for joining us here today as well. A few years ago, I didn't introduce myself, I'm sorry. I'm Evie. <laughs> I'm Evie Martin, senior pastor here at Flatwoods. There's always that little detail I'd like to include. For those of you who are new, welcome. A few years ago, um, a good friend of mine was working on his dissertation, and as he wrapped up his, his first doctoral program, I asked him some questions along the way in his journey, and I actually dived in periodically to conversation about his subject matter as his work was unfolding. That, in hindsight, is apparently more engagement than most doctoral candidates get from people outside their academic circles. <laughs> most of the rest of us don't care too much about dissertations, it turns out. But when it was all said and done, he sent me a copy, just for my leisurely reading, of course, I clicked open the file one random afternoon and started in so I could at least say that I had skimmed it. <laughs> and right off the bat, as I perused his opening acknowledgments, I was ridiculously flattered when I found my name, my own name. Granted, it was several paragraphs behind many accomplished scholars and academics and practitioners and also family and friends and many of our other colleagues, but still, he had acknowledged me. Like... I had some small part to play in this really big accomplishment in his life. 
I still haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry, Lucas, if you're watching this. But he got the degree, and he's on to his next PhD now, so he's doing just fine. A dissertation is not a goal that I have for my own life. It's not on my bucket list, so to speak. I in no way lifted a finger or did any intellectual work to consciously assist my friend in this monumental task of his own life, and yet he recognized and acknowledged that my support and encouragement had meant something to him, that it was part of his big story, and that felt really, really good. We're working our way through the character and story of Moses and the Hebrew people from the book of Exodus this month. And Exodus is an epic story, the epic story of what we call the Old Testament. And every epic story has a hero. We love hero stories. Our literature, our cinematography, and folklore, and legend are piled high with them. This is like a search and find kind of situation here. Can you identify all the heroes? The danger sometimes in an epic hero story is that we can easily forget that they are never lone rangers. Their stories don't unfold or progress or become epic entirely of their own volition. Every epic story has supporting actors. Characters along the way who lend or give essential pieces to the story. Who provide resources or wisdom for the protagonist, who save them from imminent doom, who point them in the right direction, who listen to their intellectual ramblings for their dissertation. There's no such thing as a great story with no supporting actors. And we know this, so much so that we celebrate this category. We give them awards at the Oscars, Best Supporting Actor. We dedicate pages of acknowledgments to them in books. We keep statistics on them in sports, assists, RBIs. My son Laz got his first assist in a soccer game a couple of weeks ago, and that was a big deal. He loved it just as much as he liked scoring a goal. Supporting roles in all their many forms usually have just as much to teach us as the main character, if we're paying attention. In Exodus, the story is not just about Moses. It's about a whole lot of people. And today, we're going to pay attention to some of them. Sometimes when we read these epic stories with epic heroes, we, we honestly find it a little hard to relate to those heroes. We know, most of us, that we're not really hero material, at least not of the exotic scale. <laughs> but the supporting roles invite us into spaces that feel more real, Actions and attitudes and behaviors that feel more like the things that play out in our everyday lives. So as we dive into some supporting actors today, I'll invite you to examine where you might better acknowledge these people in your own life, but also how you might become a meaningful supporting actor in someone else's story too. As I read through the whole book of Exodus again this week, I pulled out five supporting characters. There are more, of course, but I picked five and tried to name the distinct role that they play in the story. And because I love alliteration, I will unpack them for you this way. We have the courageous foremother, the companion, the celebrator, the coach, and the compliment. Now, if you're a note taker, there you go, that's your outline, take a picture, jot it down. If you're not, that's okay too. Let me just tell you their stories. In Exodus chapter one, before the name Moses has even been uttered, we get a surprising amount of information about two everyday, ordinary Hebrew women. We even get their names. And that's pretty unusual for women who aren't title characters to be given names. It's an invitation to us to take a closer look. A recap of the very beginning of the story reminds us that the status of Hebrews in Egypt has declined over several generations to the point that they now find themselves oppressed and enslaved under the rule of Pharaoh. As the Hebrew population continues to mushroom, Pharaoh feels threatened and begins to implement some control measures on this population. Exodus 1 then gives us this brief contextual tidbit. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shifra and Puah. 
When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now, the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They're much stronger. They give birth before any midwives can even get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. These are the first supporting actors we encounter in Moses' story, and chances are they never even met him. These courageous foremothers played a critical part in this epic story without ever crossing paths with the main character. These are not women with much power to speak of. Certainly, as they crouch at a laboring woman's side in the throes of pain and childbirth, they do hold most of the power in that room. Their knowledge and wisdom, their experience in troublesome scenarios, their calm and confidence in the face of new mother's panic and agony, gives them authority behind those closed doors. But you can imagine them summoned to Pharaoh's court, Shifra and Pua walking together hand in hand, their long graying hair tied back sensibly, given the nature of their work. Their eyes twinkle as they talk, for they are old friends. And the smile lines reveal the years behind this difficult but rewarding work. They've put on clean gowns today. The Pharaoh has summoned them. And only God can know what it is that he might ask of them. Their conversation lulls as the palace looms closer. Their hearts beat unknowing, untrusting, afraid. The request is harsh. Blood thunders through their eardrums as the command settles in. Kill the baby boys. Do not let them live. They are midwives. Their hands wrestle life into this world, not out of it. Their ears fill daily with first cries. Silence is deafening in their line of work. This decree violates their very calling. Every fiber of their beings resists, recoils, refuses. And so Shifra, whose name means fairness and clarity, and Pua, whose name means glitter and brilliance, march out of the Pharaoh's palace with no intention whatsoever to do what he has asked. Theirs is quite possibly the first recorded act of civil disobedience. They do not do what the law has required of them because it is unjust. It is wicked, and their very souls will not allow it. And their courage in this act of resistance changed the future of their people. Shifra and Pua used what little power they had for the purpose of thwarting evil when it looked them in the eye. Their beneficiaries were unknown to them. They took a personal risk and made the decision that was just for the sake of generations to come. Children, people, leaders, liberators, they would never meet. It may be strange to begin with supporting actors who never even cross paths with the hero, but that is what the story delivers to us. There are people whose choices for justice generations ago paved the way for you to be here, to live the life you're living, to stand up and face the world, challenges and all that we live in. It is good to stop and give thanks for the faithful people in your story. Maybe you know them, probably you don't, who took a risk and made a choice that wasn't centered on them, but on the future and you who would inhabit it. Can we in turn think about ourselves in this supporting role of courageous foremother, forerunner, if you will? People willing to stick out our necks for the injustices of today, thinking strictly not of ourselves but of the future, taking courageous risks so the world can be safer and healthier, greener, less violent, 
and more free for the people we probably will never meet because it is what is right and just and good. Your courage matters, not just to you and to those you know now, but to those who have lives that have not even yet begun. Our next supporting actor role is quite different in basically every way. <laughs> this is the role that we most easily think of when it comes to epic stories. The role is companion. This is Coach Beard to Ted Lasso. This is Hermione and Ron to Harry Potter. This is Travis Kelsey to Patrick Mahomes. I think that's two weeks in a row Travis Kelsey has made it into a sermon, so I'm just keeping track there. In the Moses story, this role goes to his brother Aaron. But Moses said to the Lord, my Lord, I've never been able to speak well, not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you've been talking to your servant. I have a slow mouth and a thick tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gives the people the ability to speak? Who's responsible for making them unable to speak or hard of hearing, sighted or blind? Isn't it I, the Lord? Now go, I'll help you speak and I'll teach you what you should say. But Moses said, please, my Lord, just send someone else. Then the Lord got angry at Moses and said, what about your brother Aaron? the Levite. I know he can speak very well. He's on his way out to meet you now. He's looking forward to seeing you. Speak to him and tell him what he's supposed to say. I'll help both of you speak, and I'll teach both of you what to do. Aaron will speak for you to the people. He'll be a spokesperson for you, and you will be like God for him. Aaron is Moses' right hand. From this moment on in Exodus, wherever we find Moses, we find Aaron. In fact, it's Aaron who does most of the talking. Throughout the whole plague sequence with Pharaoh to get the Israelites out of Egypt, Aaron is the one who speaks publicly, making God's demands of Pharaoh, speaking loudly enough for all the people to hear. If you look closely enough, if you look closely at the dialogue throughout these first many chapters of Exodus, you see Moses only speaking to God and to Aaron, and then he'll go and speak to the Pharaoh behind closed doors when they are summoned. But all of the big stuff, the bold stuff, the stuff that everybody hears, that's Aaron. That's not necessarily how we see it in the movies or in our children's Bible storybooks, is it? But Aaron is in lockstep with Moses. They could probably finish each other's sentences, and they knew with one mind what God was asking of them. Aaron is there to do difficult things with Moses, to give him courage, to share his burdens, to bounce ideas off of later when they are in the wilderness for decades on end. Without Aaron, there is no Exodus story. And yet... <laughs> His is not the name we remember. He is Moses' companion, with him in all things. This kind of supporting actor is harder to come by. Often they are friends, sometimes they are a spouse, maybe a sibling like Aaron, but they usually develop over a long time. If there is a companion in your life, maybe even one from an earlier chapter from whom you have drifted, today might be a really good day to send them a note, send them a text, give them a call, to let them know that you would not be you. You would not be who you are today without them. Maybe even recall a really specific time when they challenged you or when they stepped in with you when you were falling apart and really afraid. Let them know what that has meant to you. And then you might think about someone that you deeply believe in, someone in your life or in your circle who is living for a purpose greater than their own, like Moses was. Someone who is maybe alone, even afraid, and could use some company in the work that they have cut out for them. With a companion, they could be brave and go far. And maybe that companion is you. I don't believe that it was an afterthought that God sent Aaron with Moses. We are meant to accompany one another in this adventure of life. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
Our next kind of supporting actor is short and simple. This is the celebrator. In chapter 15, right after the Israelites have escaped Egypt and made it safely across to the other side of the Reed Sea, after the waters have parted, we see a huge party. Well, I'm assuming that it was a party. I think that's what people do when they are finally free. But there's lots of singing and dancing, and it's led by Miriam. You remember her from the very beginning? She is Moses' sister, who watched over him as he floated down the Nile in a basket. She saw him safely into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter and then finagled away for her mother to still be her nursemaid, her brother's nursemaid. This girl is scrappy, and she knew from the start that Moses had a special purpose. And now, here in their first moments of freedom, after years and years of longing, we read this. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand. All the women followed her, playing tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang the refrain back to them. Sing to the Lord for an overflowing victory. Horse and rider he threw into the sea. Miriam is someone who knows Moses, who knows what purpose God has for him, who has seen him struggle, watched him and Aaron persevere, and now she celebrates what God has done in and through them. Everyone needs a celebrator in their life. Someone who reminds you of your purpose and power. Someone who will throw a party, literally or figuratively, when you've done a really amazing thing. Who will sing a song, literally or figuratively, for you when you've done really hard things and just need to feel good about yourself for a minute. Miriam doesn't figure in as a large supporting actor, although I suspect she was much more active in the whole of the story than our text indicates. But she shows up in critical moments, in this case, to lead the singing. I bet there is someone in your life. Maybe you don't see them often, or you haven't talked in a while, but when you need a word of encouragement or someone to remind you that you're pretty amazing, you can give them a call. I have a friend like that. I don't see her often at all. She doesn't live nearby. Her life is chaotic and busy just like mine, but I can literally just text with whatever is going on in my day, and she will text back all the affirming words with all the excessive punctuation to match to remind me who I am. It doesn't take much to turn my day around because she so quickly breaks out the tambourines. And how easy is it for us to be the tambourine shakers too? Not really. I'm terrible with a tambourine. Don't ever give me one to play up here. It would be very bad. But what does it cost us to be the celebrator for someone else? Unprompted even. It costs us nothing to point out a wonderful thing that we notice in someone's life, to remember a time for them when they were faithful to God, to their convictions, their purpose, and remind them of that with lots of exclamation points. When you are a celebrator, you can turn someone's day around in an instant. More of that, please. You can start sending that text right now. I'll let you do it. Just go ahead. Be a celebrator. This next supporting role might be my favorite, just because he's so direct. This role is coach. And that word has been formalized in many ways, even beyond the sports world in recent years. We can have paid coaches for anything these days, and that's great. But this role of coach simply means someone who has enough experience to point out how you might do something better. Listen to this supporting actor, Jethro. The next day, Moses sat as a judge for the people, while the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what's this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? while all the people are standing around you from morning until evening. Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When a conflict arises between them, they come to me, and I judge between the two of them. I also teach them God's regulations and instructions. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing isn't good. You will end up totally wearing yourself out, both you and these people who are with you. The work is too difficult for you. You can't do it alone. Now, listen to me. Let me give you some advice. And may God be with you. 
Your role should be to represent the people before God. You should bring their disputes before God yourself, but you should also look among all the people for capable persons who respect God. They should be trustworthy and not corrupt. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. They should bring every major dispute to you, but they should decide all of the minor cases themselves. This will be much easier for you, and they will share your load. Jethro has come from Midian to visit Moses and the people out in the wilderness. He sees what's going on, and he's like, hang on a second. There's a much better way to do this. Now notice, he is not offering his unsolicited opinion on something he knows nothing about. That's a problem in our world today, is it not? Don't do that. Rather, do you remember what Jethro did in Midian? Anyone remember his job in Midian? Bible trivia question for you. He was a priest. He was the leader of the people there. The man knows how to organize a community. He gives Moses, who is still green in this regard, a better way to lead, and Moses does it. Who are your trusted coaches? Who in your life will say to you, what you are doing isn't good? You will end up totally wearing yourself out. Not everyone gets to be that person, right? There has to be a high level of trust, of course. But do you have people you're willing to listen to? And if so, do they know you would like their coaching, their counsel, their wisdom? Sometimes just telling a person that you'd like that from them will bless your life in ways that you can't imagine. And on the flip side, are there areas of your life where you have gained wisdom, maybe through experience, maybe through pain and trials, but at some point along the way, you may be the one to share what you know and what you see with someone who's just starting to make their way. No joke, literally as I was typing this section of my sermon, I got a text from a pastor friend of mine who's newer in ministry than I am, asking What does a pledge or stewardship letter look like? (laughs) This is not major life wisdom, but she hasn't done one, and I have. Yours are coming soon, by the way. (laughs) I don't necessarily think of myself as a coach, but in this, I could help her along. I don't doubt that you have many ways of doing the same. Finally, we end up with the supporting role of compliment. We meet briefly in the book of Exodus, a young man who will figure much more prominently in the stories yet to come in the Old Testament. But in chapter 17, the Israelites have encountered conflict out in the desert of Sinai. Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some men for us and go fight with Amalek. Moses knew that his role, his abilities, his age, his gifts, meant that he was not the one to take the men out to battle. Enter Joshua, a compliment to Moses with gifts and strengths of his own. After his success in this particular battle, we see Joshua just a couple more times in Exodus, named as Moses' assistant. But of course, as Moses' story ends, we know that Joshua is the one to take up the mantle and lead the people on into the promised land. No hero can do everything. And so a compliment supporting actor is one who can do the things you cannot, who has strength where you have weakness. In Joshua, we meet a compliment who also takes the baton then and continues the work. Compliments are not always easy for us to acknowledge. We live in a culture where it is difficult to admit weakness or accept help or name that we simply cannot do it all on our own. And yet, Moses would have been up a creek without Joshua's gifts and strength. Who are we to think that we are good at everything, strong in every area? Calling out other people's gifts and talents is what good heroes do. Letting them shine in their moment for the sake of the whole story. What are your weaknesses? And who comes alongside you with strengths that you could never imagine? Do you feel threatened by that? 
Or do you see how God is up to something in bringing people together as a whole? And do you offer your own self, your unique design to be useful for what God is up to in someone else's life, or even bigger, in our whole story, in our life together here as a church? Are you a complement to what God is doing in us together? There are no small parts, only small actors. Konstantin Stanislavski has famously said, and I found this poignant excerpt about him in Acting Magazine, which will leave us with our task for today. Stanislavski is known as the father of modern acting and revolutionized the craft of acting, not only for lead performers, but also for bit actors and background actors. Prior to him, actors with smaller roles often gave smaller performances. They moved with no sense of purpose. They performed their characters with no depth, no commitment. In effect, they were spectators more than they were actors. Stanislavski found this unacceptable. He required actors who performed in his theater productions to engage their roles with equal commitment, whether they were the lead actors with large roles or supporting actors with few lines or no lines at all. When Stanislavski's company, the Moscow Art Theater, toured the world, audiences were amazed at this sea change. Not only did the lead actors perform their characters with depth and truth, but actors in the background moved with a sense of purpose. They were not mere spectators. They were actors fully committed to achieving their character's objective, whether they had a speaking role or not. In Moses' story, we understand better how God intends for God's whole story to unfold. We are the actors some lead, some supporting, courageous, companion, celebrator, coach, or compliment. But no part is small. And we have the choice, really the call, to act out our lives together with depth and truth, with a sense of purpose, and fully committed to God's objectives. That is what will make the story epic. Will you pray with me? God, on the stages of our lives, may we see your hand at work. In our own lives, as we take on roles of courage and companionship, as we celebrate others and offer our wisdom and help carry others' loads. And may we see your hand at work in the lives of others, as we experience their support and encouragement. May we give thanks as we live into the beauty of a story that is never told alone. For you are with us, we are with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Those colors brightly shines Can never see its purpose In the pattern of the grand design And the stone that sits on the very top Of the mountain's mighty face Does it think it's more important That the stones have formed the base So how can you see what your life is worth And where your values lie You can never see through the eyes of man you Must look at your life Look at your life through heaven's eyes. A lake of gold in the desert sand is less than a cool, fresh spring, and to one last sheep. A shepherd boy is greater than the richest king. If a man lose everything he owns, is it truly lost his worth? Or is it the beginning 
of a new and brighter birth. So how can he measure the worth of a man and walk or strength of size and how much he gained, how much he gained? The answer will come. The answer will come to him who tries to look at his light through heaven's eyes. And that's what we share, what we have with you. There's little to be found. God is nothing, there's a lot to go around. No life can escape being blown about by winds of change and chance. And though you never learn all the steps, you must learn to join the dance. You must learn to join the dance. on earth look through heaven's eyes look at your life look at your life look at your life That was awesome. <laughs> From the actual movie, The Prince of Egypt, if you didn't recognize that number, that was fantastic. Thank you all so much. As we think about supporting actors in this story and looking at our lives together through heaven's eyes, I think about our church. I think about the ways that every Sunday morning, every weekday, um, in a community of faith, it takes all of us as supporting, supporting actors um, in so many different ways um, to live out the life that we have that God has together for us. So I just wanted to share um, a little bit about some of our some of our special volunteers, some of our volunteers who make life happen together here at Platwood Church. My name is Warren Horsley. I am Pastor Jess' son. I help out because this church is amazing and it has super kind people. I like to do the cafe and I love just greeting people because I get it from my dad and he's an amazing person. I help out here every couple of weeks. Like I do slides and help with Kirk. I help out in Kids Connection. I'm in the three and four year old room monthly. Love them. Best part of what I do here. If you wanna have some fun on Sunday morning, Kids Connection is where to go. I wanted to be on the hospitality team because I knew how valuable it was for me with my experience starting at the church. The reason that we picked Potwoods is because um, the moment we walked into the church, we felt um, welcomed by the hospitality team, and we felt like it was an environment that we belonged to immediately. We really like to stay connected with the church. I know like it's, it just makes church feel more like home, and we felt like that was the best way that we could help to just get people involved, um, but also just welcome them to the church that we love. I've gotten many friends of me greeting because every day you meet someone new. It's super gratifying to volunteer here and see what you're doing has an effect on everyday church life. Just attending the worship services on Sunday, it's important, but that's not how you're going to form connections. Plugging into a ministry is how you're going to feel like this is your church home sharing your gifts, that's what we're here to do. Hopefully some familiar faces there for some of you and our volunteers. I know Jackson's in the back today. He's doing, uh, he, I think he was on the graphics. All the graphics in the sermon were Jackson, so thank you for that. Uh, behind the scenes for sure. But each one of us has a way, a part to play um, in support of what God is doing here. We do that every week during this time of worship. We practice the act of generosity, um, giving an offering as part of our support for this community. And so during this time, um, think about ways that you can give generously of your own resources, but also if you don't have a place that you're plugged in to serve um, and connect in this community, stop by and see Michael at our, at our welcome desk or talk to one of the pastors or a staff member after worship. We would love to help you find that place um, that brings you life and brings this community life together. During this time of offering, you can find ways to give online securely. You'll see that information on the screen, but I pray that God will multiply our gifts as we support this community together.
invite you to stand and join us. Let's sing to the Lord. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met. You may be seated. Joining a church, uh, choosing intentionally to be a part of Plattwood Church is a serious commitment. This morning, we'd like to celebrate our newest member uh, named Mary, Mary Nell Donahoe, who earlier this week, she had her membership vow with Pastor Jazz. It was Tuesday. And um, she passed Thursday morning. She has suffered from a rare form of blood cancer. She was very adamant about making Plattwood's church as her spiritual home. She was a lifetime Methodist. Uh, she moved from Ar uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. She has been with us. Uh, through her suffering, uh, she made this church as her new family. 
And she, her last wish was to become a member of Platwood's church. Her membership made me think the meaning and value of being a member of Platwood's church. So I'd like to have with you this membership vow, even though she's just only here in spirit together. I will just read this question. She said yes. So maybe this is time. Can you can yes as a renewal of your membership? And then we will do our part, commit ourselves to this membership celebration of Mary Nell Donahoe complete today. So this is a question. Do you renew and affirm the vows taken at your baptism? Say yes. As a member of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen the church's ministries? As a member of Platwood's church, would you faithfully participate in its ministries, ministry of gathering, growing, giving, and going with your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness? So now to you, all of you spiritual friends of Mary Nell Donahoe, you are the body of Christ and members of household of God. I commend you to mutual love and care. You are called to all you can do to increase each one's faith. Confirm the hope and perfect the love of all members here at Plattwood's Church. Let us pray. Thank you for the life of Mary Nell, her spiritual legacy for this church. She was such a gift to her family and friends. We believe she is in eternity. Just give your peace to all who mourn for their loss and help us to love your church and commit ourselves to it as Mary, Mary Nell showed us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. What a gift that our connection extends far beyond these moments and this life. We are one in Christ, now, always, and forever. As we prepare to go forth into this week ahead, I invite each one of you to take a next step in your journey of faith. Um, for those of you who are new with us, the very best way to do that is simply to connect. Take a moment, stop by our welcome desk, see Michael out there. We have a gift for you just to say thank you for being our guest today. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And for everyone else, if you'll take a moment to scan the QR code or take that postcard home with you, scan the QR code. You can find all the ways that you can get connected, that you can grow in your faith here at Platwoods this week. Um, a couple of things I'll bring to your attention. First of all, next Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. is our trunk or treat. All are invited. Um, you can come and participate. You can bring friends, neighbors family. You can come on your own, but also we, we could still use trunks and candy. We could, we'll use trunks and candy up until the moment it's happening. So stop by and see Mandy at our Kid Connection desk if you can help out with that. And then finally, uh, we have a, an event, a workshop called Putting Your House in Order coming up on Saturday, November 4th. This is an amazing class for anyone, people of all ages. If you are managing your finances, this is for you. Um, we all have stuff, and we sometimes struggle to take care of it. So we have a guest coming in to teach us how to put our house in order. You can register for that um, online. Just go to our events page by clicking, uh, scanning that QR code as well. But that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. If you will, please rise, and let's go forth with this blessing. May Jesus be our guide as we step into hard places with courage and curiosity. And may our path be one of belonging and full life together in Christ. Go in peace. Amen.